The structure of our universe has been a source of mystery since the times of the Greek philosophers more than 2,000 years ago. Although advances in science during the past 100 years have opened new doors into the source of atomic energy and gravity, our understanding of most things in our universe is still quite limited. As we delve deeper into the subatomic realm, leaving behind Newtonian and even Einsteinian physics to embrace new discoveries in quantum physics, the tools required to pierce the veil of the fabric of our cosmos become ever more complicated. We are today entering an era during which we will be able to look back to the beginnings of time in our universe, revealing its geometry and evolution through an ever-increasing amount of observational data. We are beginning to see remarkable similarities between the structures of biological systems here on Earth and cosmological structures throughout our observable universe. Is it possible that we are but one universe that has evolved on a cosmic tree of other universes? Places that have different laws of physics that are rooted in their own evolution and which may interact with their own world? As we continue to learn more, we remain fascinated by a question of what is reality? Have our minds evolved to accept a linear timeline, perceiving what our biology has predetermined as reality? Was Plato's allegory of the cave a foretelling of what we may eventually discover, that our observed reality is largely rooted in our own minds? And can we learn to transcend that perceived reality? Will understanding gravity at a quantum level open the next door to unraveling the secrets of our universe? As we gain more understanding and control of the fabric of our cosmos, the potential for our civilization as one of explorers is tremendous. From NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and the author of Mind, Space, and Cosmos, exploring the mystery of space and how we think about it, would you please welcome Sten Hohenwald. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you all tonight uh, for being here instead of watching down from Abbey. <laughs> 45 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I actually did want to see this, this episode tonight. <laughs> There's also the, uh, the Primetime Academy Awards on Channel 4. So I, I see that, that you've all made a tremendous sacrifice on a Sunday night to be here with me talking <coughs> about something that you probably don't even recognize as a question. You know, I'm, why are you doing this? Uh, 2003, well, first of all, uh, I'm an astronomer, all right, uh, since 82 when I got my doctorate. Before then, I was an amateur astronomer. Uh, I got my start at age 10 when my dad showed me the stars in Orion after a Cub Scout night pack me. Uh, built my first telescope, a four inch, when I was 11. Built my second one, which was an eight inch, when I was in high school. Did a lot of astrophotography and dragged an awful lot of friends up to the mountains to look at the sky at night, drink a lot of Coca-Cola, and eat really bad salami. <laughs> uh, that's how we stayed awake. Um, so, I was also really interested in science fiction. I mean, and, and that's something that I hear a lot from science scientists that I know, is that, quite frankly, when we were growing up, <laughs> we weren't living in this world at all. <laughs> that's the big secret. You know, we were living in a sort of a quasi-real fantasy world, you know, where we were absorbing science fact, you know, we were melding it with colonizing the universe and, you know, rocketry and warp drive and all these great things. You know, it was a very fluid existence. It's the kind of thing that kids intrinsically understand and adults have a real tough time remembering. And the reason is because our brains are not the same. So it's not our fault, right? Uh, when your brains are extremely plastic, you know, up to the age of 20, they can be in places that they can't be as adults. Right? Now, this challenge that you have as a scientist is to keep that sort of fantasy world going for as long as you can. Because it turns out that fantasy world is a really great driver of creativity by finding odd conjunctions of information, right? That can sometimes drive the next scientific breakthrough. You know, grabbing things from different baskets that nature never intended to be together, <laughs> you know, is a powerful dynamic that can drive a lot of great science, and does for many scientists who can reach into those places and unabashedly come up with connections that your average adult really can't do anymore, or is too involved with the here and now world that they can't find time to put that stuff into play anymore. Right? 
So it's kind of like a muscle. If you don't use the muscle, it atrophies. You know, it's still there. You can still use it at some level, but you know, it ain't as good as it was when you were younger. Right. Now, now that I've made you all feel terrible and bad, <laughs> right? now we have another problem. You, you hear all the time that humans are fantastic tool makers. You know, in fact, quintessentially, when you do, you know, the, the paleological study of humans, we are identified as the quintessential tool makers. It started out with banging rocks together, you know, making arrowheads and all that, you know, up through building supercomputers and DNA sequencers and things like that. We're tool makers. The thing is that in some areas of exploration, it's hard to distinguish the, tr the tool from the thing in itself. Here's an example. For thousands of years, um, people thought about the idea of the atom. It was a mathematical idea, nobody could prove that it existed. From the time of Leucippus, back in the ancient Greek time, all the way up until the time of Dalton, atoms were considered theoretical. They were mostly mathematical kinds of things. Even Dalton, the chemist, used them as a kind of a mathematical tool to organize elements and simple chemical reactions. And then, of course, Mendeleev, you know, did his thing and created sort of the periodic table. But atoms were still very hypothetical and just basically mathematical tools for understanding how matter was organized at the small scale. Um, until fairly recently when we could actually directly image atoms uh, using scanning tunnel, tunneling microscopy or field ion microscopy and many techniques like that since the 60s. So there was a time when the idea of the atom was a mathematical concept which we projected into the world as though it were a real thing. And we manipulated the world in terms of atoms as though they were absolutely bona fide real things that had certain properties to them that we could classify. So the tool for a period of time became a reality until we could actually detect them directly. <coughs> That is part of the problem that we have when we ask questions like, what is space? Because for almost the entire existence of humans on this planet, we've had this sort of intrinsic idea what space is, right? It's, and you throw up your hands like this, it's this, this is space, right? Uh, and if you were really clever, you can say, oh, I know something else about space, it's it's three-dimensional. Move forward, sideways, up. That's it. So there are three perpendicular directions that I can move. And all of a sudden, wow, you know, I can create coordinate systems. All right, I can categorize where everything is located in this room in terms of their coordinates. So we think about space not as what it is, but as this mathematical tool for organizing this, this property of our environment. And then we start heaping even more mathematics on top of that. We talk about curvature. We talk about metric, Pythagorean theorems, uh, specific types of geometry. And the way that that is applied to the world is that, well, we live in a world of three dimensions, so here we have all these mathematical tools that we've created since the 1800s that talk about the mathematical properties of abstract three-dimensional spaces. And we say, well, we can create with those abstract spaces all these tools to analyze how they are built. And then we take the next step and say, because those tools apply to this abstraction, Surely they must somehow apply to the real thing in which we live. And so that's, that's how it works in, in certain areas of physics. They create these tools, and the tools sort of get imbued with a vision of the thing being that. Let me show you some examples here. Um, OK, um, we've got our standard coordinate reference frame in three dimensions. You know, it's this wonderful Cartesian thing. Uh, very pretty, very fundamental. 
Uh, for a very long time, people had trouble thinking about space, believe it or not. Uh, they thought that space was a property of body. Uh, there could be nothing like a void that was empty of space, because space was a property of body. And so the coordinates that you create for space were coordinates of and in the body. So I use this wireframe image of a head as an example of that. And what is the stuff that surrounds the head? It's black. Well, according to them, it's nothing. There's nothing there. There's no space, there's nothing. Because space has a geometry, the geometry is in the body, and the body is there. Okay? You see where I'm going with this? Maybe not. The way that we think about space for a long time has always been space is a property of the bodies themselves. Okay? We can talk about the geometry of the Earth is a sphere. Okay? The sphere of the Earth is the body, planet Earth. Uh, we can draw these coordinate grid lines on a human in a wireframe kind of a way, and we can define the coordinates of cells within that body based on that coordinate system. That's all good. But what goes on in that darkness there, the mathematicians will tell you, oh, that's simply a background Euclidean flat space that has its own coordinate system that we are just simply not using right now. That point right there is real, but there's nothing there. That's why it's black. At this point, there is something there, so that's fine. So, that's one way in which things have changed a little bit. Now, Thinking about space has another problem attached to it, and that is that when we try to create a description for what space is, and space is an intangible thing for the most part, you know, we are kind of left in a kind of a quandary. Because the, the human brain likes to work in terms of sensory information, and it likes to sort of integrate that and find patterns, uh, and it's extremely good at pattern recognition. But when you ask it to find patterns in something for which there is nothing apparently there, ain't nothing it can do about it. So one thing that we've found is that uh, the brain tends to fabricate things. It makes stuff up. Uh, how many of you are aware that we basically have a, a, a right and a left brain, called a dominant and a minor hemisphere? You, you've all, have you heard this language before? You know. Uh, if you're right-handed, then your left hemisphere has your language centers, your centers of you know, logical sort of integration, mathematic mathematical reasoning, uh, perception of uh, time and space as sort of logical uh, ideas. Uh, your right hemisphere, which is also called the minor hemisphere, uh, doesn't have language centers. How, does, how do you know that it's there? It can't communicate with language like words. It communicates by sort of gut feelings. You know, like whenever you discover something, you get this aha sense. Well, that's, that's the way the right hemisphere communicates with you. It makes you feel aha, you know, whatever that emotion is. Uh, it's fantastic at finding big patterns and not worrying too much about laws and logic. Uh, simplistically, we say that artists, uh, people in music, are really good on the right hemisphere, and scientists are really good on the left hemisphere, and that's kind of a, an urban legend. Because <coughs> artists are good in both hemispheres. Uh, scientists are also good in both hemispheres. Uh, creative scientists get their creativity by looking at bigger things and visceral patterns that they don't even understand are being used and manipulated, and then get that aha moment and then subject them to the language of mathematics to kind of build up an explanation for what they just you know, figured out. Um, so that's sort of the way it plays out. Uh, now the thing is that human brains have been around for a very long time. And here is a, basically a roadmap 
of some of the major nerve tracts within the brain uh, at about uh, <coughs> half a millimeter or so resolution. Uh, there's a big uh, effort afoot now uh, sponsored by a huge grant given to uh, a number of universities to build one of these roadmaps at a few tens of microns resolution. So we'll be able to get a good sense for essentially how large clusters of neurons in the brain communicate to each other throughout the entire corpus of the brain. So we'll be able to build basically a circuitry diagram. Once we have that, you know, there's no telling what's going to come out of it, but there's some things that we already know about the brain and how the brain builds up ideas about how the world is put together. Now, the, way, the reason I'm belaboring this and why this has anything to do with our understanding of space is because space is an intangible thing which is very core of experimental data. And so we really have to ask the question, how is the brain going to construct an explanation for what that is, given that most of that information is intangible? So we have to look carefully at how the brain normally comes up with ideas for things. Uh, and it's not a random process at all. Um, but there are ways of subverting that process. Uh, stroke victims uh, go into neurology labs all the time with uh, sometimes very strange kinds of conditions. Uh, in one case, there'd be a condition where uh, somebody says that, well, this isn't my right hand, this is my brother's right hand. And it's like, what are you talking about? It's connected to your body. No, this is my brother's right hand. It's not that they're stupid. It's not that they're blind and can't see that the hand is connected, but their internal model that they have created for that moment, for that particular chunk of matter, is in variance with what you and I are seeing. But they believe totally. This, this is my brother's arm. My brother lives in California. There are other kinds of agnosians, they're called, uh, that are equally bizarre, uh, in which Essentially, we begin to understand from these pathologies just how the brain puts together models of the sensory world that it finds itself in. Uh, it'd be interesting to know that, um, you know, out of all the communication that goes on within the human brain, it's been estimated at several billion uh, bits per second for all the neuron traffic everywhere within the brain. Uh, maybe only a hundred bits of that come from the outside world. The brain spends most of its time talking to itself and not getting a whole lot of information from the outside world. You know, even you're looking at me, there's only a very small portion of your retina that is actually seeing me in clarity. And if you look off that axis, things get fuzzier and fuzzier. You know, you can see that there's a person standing over there, but you can't make out they've got two arms or four, you know. But right in the center of your field of view, that's where you're getting your most information. And that's not a whole lot of uh, rods and cones in your eye. In terms of your ear, I mean, we can go down the physiology ladder, and it, and it's, it might not be 100 bits, but it's on that order. It's certainly not a trillion bits. And so the point is that the brain spends a lot of its neural traffic talking to itself. There's a big highway between the left and right hemisphere called the corpus callosum. Uh, for people that are very creative, uh, innovative, uh, that is unusually large compared to the average. Uh, the thing about Einstein's brain wasn't that there was anything obviously strange about it, that it had more nerve cells in it. It's that its corpus callosum was about 50% larger than anybody else in his age group. So he had an awful lot of traffic going on between the left and right hemispheres, between the hemisphere of finding these big visceral patterns and the hemisphere that converts that into a mathematical description of that so he can explain it to somebody else. Right? In understanding space, we're, we have to tread very carefully uh, because the brain is just as facile working with pure symbols of things as it is in working with sensory information. It can manipulate and imagine to be real symbolic things, not specific things that the senses provide. So 
when we think about mathematics, mathematics, as we all know, is a symbolic language. We have symbols that we have imbued with this symbol represents this operation, that symbol represents x, an unknown quantity, uh, so on and so forth. The thing that happens with the brain is the brain easily conflates the symbolism for an experience that that might be what the thing is of, of itself. So, you've all heard about something called space-time, perhaps? The basis of relativity theory is a thing called space-time. The idea that three-dimensional space isn't enough. We need time to define, as well, to define where everything is in the world at any particular moment. So, atoms and humans represent tracks, called world lines, that move through space-time. That's a wonderful representation of the physical world. Physicists use it. It's a geometric and very sort of visual way of thinking about interactions between particles and things. Uh, it ultimately develops itself into something called general relativity, where we can talk about space-time being curved and distorted. But the problem is that space-time is a tool. It's not a thing, it's a tool. It's a tool that we've created to try to answer visually certain types of physical questions that we've posed. How do particles interact with each other traveling at 90% the speed of light? How does radiation move from one particle to another and cause an interaction? How do we calculate those things exactly and accurately in terms of time durations, space, and strengths of interaction? Those are all questions that we can now answer rather nicely using this tool called space-time. Uh, other things that come from that... Oh, okay, I'm sorry, here's something. Uh, i taking a back step to talking about the brain again. Uh, how many of you have gone to the optometrist, you know, and they say, okay, where's, your, uh, where's that spot in your visual field where things sort of wink out, blind spot? Heard about your blind spot? Everybody's got one. Uh, there's a, I mean, it's about the size of a quarter, and it's located about, you can almost see where it is, you know, if you do one of these experiments, eventually your hand disappears. But when you take your hand down, you have the perception that, no, there's no hole there. There's no darkness there. What has happened is that the brain has interpolated the information, has basically erased that blind spot for you. So you never even know it's there. Uh, unless you do a particular kind of experiment. Uh, other kinds of real physical things that the brain does is, uh, is here. What is this? It can either be two phases in pro profile, or it can be the stem of a wine goblet. You can see one, and you can see the other, but you cannot see both at the same time. Your brain switches back and forth between the two ways of looking at this very simple picture. <clears throat> so that shows another limitation of the brain. This is purely a brain limitation. It's not because I've drawn this in any kind of a strange way that tips off the brain. The brain can look at things, but it can't look at simultaneous <coughs> conflicting things. And that's the problem. Uh, you might know that we have this issue in physics called uh, wave-particle dualism. You can create a theory for how things work using a particle description, or you can use a theory that emphasizes the wave properties of particles. And you can do the same calculation, get the same answers. But there is no theory that we have created so far that does both of these simultaneously. That kind of division between conflicting pictures is mirrored in our perception of things. It's very fundamental. Here's something else that's kind of cool. Look at that for a while. What do you see? Anything interesting going on? Pulsing. Yeah, it's moving. But this isn't a GIF movie movie. This is a static image. But the brain is looking at that and is wrestling with something that physiologists kind of understand. 
but you see motion going on in something which is not moving. There is no, nothing inherent about this thing that suggests that there's movement, but yet the brain creates movement where there is none. So the brain can do all kinds of funny things. So you have to understand that when you ask questions like, what is space? And you don't have a lot of anchor points. And all you have is mathematics. Your brain is going to do some really interesting things with that. And that's why there are so many physicists working on the subject and writing so many papers. You know, we've, we've kind of gone a long way in physics and astronomy. I'm not a physicist, and I don't, I don't have to shrill for physicists. Uh, I'm an astronomer, proud of it, hard carrying. Um, but the thing is that when you read, and I've read quite a lot of discussions by physicists about the nature of space, uh, you're going to discover something rather interesting. Oh, by the way, you find almost no discussions about the nature of space coming from astronomers. Now, arguably, I'm one of the, the more prolific writers for astronomy and sky and telescope on the nature of cosmology and, and physics in this particular area since the 1980s. Um, I think I've written more articles than any living astronomer for these two magazines on this subject. Um, I say that with a kind of a measure of pride. But also as a statement that I've been wrestling with this subject for at least 30 years and more, and I've, been, I've met Stephen Hawking on a number of occasions, I've met Nobel Prize winning physicists and had discussions with them. I am no slouch to having had discussions with people who know a thing or two and are creating some of the cutting edge ideas today. But the ultimate issue of what is space is something which still eludes even the best minds today. And it turns out to be an excruciatingly difficult topic because so many things come into play in how we set up the question, you know, that we're almost guaranteed to get quite a few different types of answers, each leading to schools of physics, you know, lots of postdocs and graduate students, uh, lots of big grants, from NSF to pursue uh, lots of faculty appointments. Uh, the current big school is uh, string theory. Um, many experimental physicists, among them many Nobel laureates, find this an abomination. And they say so. You know, we have done, these, the physics community has done these young physicists a great disservice by getting them all sucked up in string theory. And uh, there, there some real, there's some real tension out there in physics land. Amongst us astronomers, we don't deal with those subjects, you know, um, because our scheme is, is the cosmic scheme, and, uh, you know, we don't worry about these, these sort of subtle issues about the nature of space. You know, most of us uh, are trained in classical astronomy. Uh, very few of us really have even taken a course in general relativity, although we know enough about it to do undergraduate discussions about the nature of you know, space and things like that. But in terms of deep thinking on the subject, it's just not something that we need to do. It, it's a tool that lacks an application at this time. Uh, one thing you should also think about, when you read these popularizations uh, by physicists on the nature of the physical universe, uh, I'm thinking in terms of Stephen Hawking. How many of you have read Stephen Hawking's book? He's had a number of books. He's had a number of steps up, you know, to that, you know, to discuss the nature of space. Uh, Lisa Randall, Princeton, uh, she works on brain theory, which is a derivative of string theory. She's put out some lovely books. Um, very few of these, however, are deeply self-reflective of the nature of space itself. The way that they take, take the subject <coughs> it, it, is they give you sort of this grand sort of picture, and then they immediately rush into the sort of nuances and, and little mathematical puzzles that they themselves have sort of resolved, all right? Not that I'm saying that these books are self-indulgent, but most of the discussion in these books are about things that we have no way of proving exist. I want to also key you in on something that, 
that you should think about for just a moment. Uh, Stephen Hawking is admittedly a world-famous cosmologist, uh, quantum physicist, uh, has basically done most of the work on black holes on a fundamental, uh, in a fundamental way. Absolutely none of his ideas have ever been verified experimentally. None. He holds sort of the unique position in physics of being just this masterful mind in physics, of which he is. There, is there are very few people uh, that, that can outperform him mathematically and in terms of his insight on black hole theory and things like that. But the problem is that is that enough to give one creds for understanding the physical world. It all depends on what kind of a story you want. What kind of a story do you want? Do you want a story that's sort of rooted in, in observational things, fundamentally, which uh, tends to be what astronomers like? Uh, are you more interested in simply just a good story that gives you a lot of oohs and ahs and things to think about, but we all have to admit you know, none of us can read most of these books, even the popularizations, and really understand what the heck these people are talking about. Because first, we don't understand string theory mathematics. And the analogies they come up with stem from that. But we can't look behind the screen and see what it is that this analogy is coming out from to gauge whether or not it's making any sense or not. So, that's part of the dilemma that, you know, if you want a story that's simply a good story, then by all means, you know, these, these are really good books. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't read them, uh, because fundamentally there's, there's nothing bad about a good story. But if you're the kind of person that not only wants a good story about the physical world, but one which has some possibility of actually saying something accurate about the physical world, then the recommendation is that you need to stay away, you, you need to go on a diet. You need to reduce your intake of string theory calories. <laughs> <laughs> you need to spend more time going to the CERN education site and seeing what the Large Hadron Collider <coughs> is producing. That's real solid physics. And listen to what the experimenters are saying, because those experimenters are no slouches. Their brains are, they have huge brains. They really do vamp up, zombies love them. <laughs> you know, they, they have to not only be monsters when it comes to building <coughs> equipment to do stuff, but they've also got to understand the theory, because the theory is a bunch of equations. They have to know how to take those equations, convert them into something they can measure, and then build equipment to go and make the measurement. So experimenters, you know, they're huge. You know, they, they really, they have, huge chops, they really lead the, the parade on this um, But frankly, when it comes to talking about space, I don't think any of us can avoid the temptation of trying to look behind the curtain. You know, what, what is it, you know? All right, let, let me, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. I always do that. You know, we look in the sky, you know, and there's space, there is a kind of space, there's stars, you know, space, things in space. So forth. Um, here is uh, my comment that uh, you know the brain uses tools. Uh, we use clocks and meter sticks. Uh, we use the Large Hadron Collider. This is the, the Alpha detector, the Atlas detector, rather. Uh, we use calculators and, and formulae, um, and it all comes down to this thing. How many recognize that? That's you. That's your brain. That's your brain on science. <laughs> it's trying to take information and sort of integrate it into some kind of an idea of what's going on in the world. What are the rules of operation of the physical world? And it uses mathematics to do that, but then the mathematics start to take on a life of their own, and we begin to look at the mathematics as being the thing in itself. That when you create a mathematics and say something about matter being atoms, you say, oh, you know, matter is atoms, and that's a mathematical statement. Then we go out and see atoms, whoa, the mathematics is actually a way of looking at the world without even having to do the experiment, because we created the, the thing as a mathematical idea, and that idea was correct. That happens uh, about one out of every two times. 
<laughs> you, know, you create a mathematical idea, but the thing is you always have to test it against the outside world, otherwise you don't know what elements of your math are, you know, things that the brain has cooked up, you know, because the brain likes to cook up things. Um, now here's something else. How many of you recognize this? Okay. This is a symbol. What is it a symbol of? It's a symbol of a radio. Crystal radio. It is, uh, basically is a very simple radio. Uh, the type that uh, my grandparents used to use. Um, it's, it's totally a symbol. Uh, is it a radio? No. It's not a radio. It's a symbol of a radio. It's a functional symbol that tells you how to build a radio. That functional symbol has elements to it. The diodes, batteries, capacitors, uh, loops of wire, antennas, ground, switches. Uh, all of those things that you see are symbols for things that are things like batteries you can buy at the store or pieces of wire. But it's not a radio. This is the radio. It looks very different from the symbol, doesn't it? If you were just looking at the symbol, would you ever have any idea that this is what it was describing? No. Not at all. Unless you looked at this thing and reduced it to its component parts and figured out how they were connected together and then created a symbol for each of those parts, and you would eventually get back to the thing that I just showed you. But the symbol and the tool is different from the real thing. Okay, here's another symbol. This represents two particles interacting and exchanging a uh, photon between them. So this is what's called a Feynman diagram. Uh, each of those elements is uh, a mathematical symbol. Uh, in fact, uh, at the time that Feynman was creating these, there, were, there was only one way that people could do this calculation to figure out how strong this interaction is. They had to write down an integral with those parts in the integral in the right order. It was uh, this part for the interaction node. There was the second part in the middle that described the momentum transfer the photon was doing. And then there was the interaction node on the other side. Now, it's easy to do it for this kind of a diagram, but typical interaction diagrams have dozens of these kinds of things in them and things going on all over the place. So it becomes really kind of complicated to write down those integrals and evaluate them. Because you have to have some idea mathematically of what symbols go with each other and in what order in order to make the answer a real number, <laughs> basically. What Feynman did was basically to say, let's look at this as a visual thing. And he created this visualization of this mathematical formula. And that visual thing is what is called the Feynman diagram. Okay. So here's another one of those Feynman diagrams. And in fact, if you were an enterprise, enterprising child in your notebook, when you're listening to a history talk by your teacher, but you're not interested in the history talk, you can fill up your notebook with Feynman diagrams and just have a whale of a good time. That's something that I used to do. <laughs> Embarrassingly enough, uh, I also used to put in diagrams of radios and things that you would never want to build because they would probably blow up. You know, that was my thrill when I was able to build things that would blow up. This is sort of a big theme in these notebooks, doodles, uh, whether it was. Uh, Star, Star Trek uh, battles or things blowing up. It's always a common thing. Anyway, once you, identify, once you see what this kind of a pattern looks like, a diagram looks like, you can create these diagrams yourself. You don't have to have a huge brain that knows how to assemble factors in the right order. But, you know, once you, and I mean you, have assembled these kinds of patterns, you could get a trained crack physicist I don't mean crack and badly, 
uh, to come in and convert that into a formula, turn the crank and come out with a number that tells how strong or how likely that particular pattern is. This is a tool. This is not what the particles are doing. This is just a tool. This is not meant to be a snapshot of anything real. And you can know that that's true because we have an electron represented as a narrow, thin line. But we all know from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that electrons are distributed things, that the more you try to pinpoint where they are, the fuzzier their speed gets, and it's kind of a fuzzy thing. And light rays don't behave like wiggly lines, they behave like beams of things that go off into space in all directions. Right? And in fact, the calculation that involves this diagram is a multiple integral in which each integration is over the entire volume of the universe. Because this photon could be anywhere in the universe that it possible. So you have to integrate a whole shebang. So this is not a real picture of a real thing. It's a mathematical tool. What is the real thing that it represents? Uh, even Feynman, who basically invented these diagrams, says, I don't know what they represent. They're just a tool, a tool that helps me do a calculation. Um, and he's also said that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. <laughs> Nobody understands quantum mechanics. It's not your fault. <laughs> All right? And so here's the, here's the thing. The brain and its mathematics and its symbolism that it sucks out of the right hemisphere because that's where patterns and big pictures take place creates this sort of diagram of things going on in the world. But it doesn't necessarily represent what's really going on. What happened at, at the time of the Newtonian revolution was something really dramatic that you know, Newton created basically classical physics, how gravity operates. Um, he gave us sort of this idea that there's this absolute reference space in, in the universe uh, within which everything moves, and we can calculate positions, calculate forces, we can figure out tides on the Earth and all this. People were just in awe of the capabilities of, of physics at that point. Any kind of physical calculation that people could come up with, there was something doing. So, Mathematics became not just a representation of what was happening, but the thing itself. That when I do the orbit of a comet in this equation, that really is something that's going on in the real world. There really is a comet doing that. We're having the same problem here, because we're coming up with a variety of ideas. Um, particle physics, you know, here we have these tracks of particles. You know, the particles are, are illuminated along the particular lines. But what's going on in between here, in the dark areas? Einstein said specifically, and this is something that Newton would have completely disagreed with. Einstein said that space and time are conditions in which we think. They are not conditions in which we exist. Space and time are things that we are creating as ideas in our heads to organize what we think we are seeing of the world. But that is not the way the world is necessarily operating. That's a very hard thing to, to really get an idea about. It's even worse because <coughs> Einstein said that Newton, Newton's idea that there was this absolute reference space in the universe is completely wrong. There is no absolute framework gates which things work. The reason we call it relativity is because everything is relative to each other. That when we measure time, time is measured by a collection of atoms. And we use that to gauge what's happening with another collection of atoms. There is no absolute time that is flowing within the system. And so that also means that that instead of this idea that somehow there's this space out there against which and within which we are embedded, we have to get rid of that idea completely. It is not consistent with relativity. It is a 300-year-old fiction 
but it is a fiction that we have internally as humans. It's, it's the fiction that our brains have. Because that's the easiest and simplest way to organize what's going on by using this absolute framework as a guide. Now, that means that there are basically two schools. There's the one school that says space is absolute and fixed out there, and that particles and fields move against this framework. And we use that framework to gauge the positions of particles in space and strengths of fields in time. That's how that absolute framework helps us. Relativity says there is no absolute framework. Coordinates come and coordinate systems come from relative measurements between things that exist. Whether those are photons, electrons, planets, <coughs> virtual particles. So here's the deal. Here's what we think. Um, we think in terms of matter, uh, fields that act between matter, um, as basically the frosting on a cake. The body of the cake is space, pure space, three-dimensional space. And that somehow fields and particles are painted on space. So basically it's like looking at a glass of red wine, that particles and fields are the red of the wine, <laughs> and space is the volume. They're two different things, but they coexist. And they're inseparable from each other. That's one way of looking at it. Um, and another way of looking at it in more detail is that we have this space-time diagram. Uh, here we have a particle that's just staying in one place in space, but moving forward in time. Here's another particle that's uh, originally stayed in one part of space and moved forward in time. Uh, but then it sent a light message, which was received by the other particle at point C, changed its direction a little bit, uh, emitted another photon, which went up at B, and so forth. Okay, so there's only the particle here, the particle here, and a particle of light emitted at A, and a particle of light emitted at B. Einstein says that's all there is. That's all you need to define the geometry of space. All these other squares that you see here are fictitious. They mean absolutely nothing. These are Einstein's own words. These are fictions. These are convenient fictions that we use in our brain to help us organize how these other things are moving. So that's why we have these two schools in physics today. String theory says, Things look like this. We have a background space, and we have the strings moving and dividing through that background space. But there is always a background space. Uh, in what's called loop quantum gravity, they say there is no background space whatsoever. There is only the loops. And space and time are created by the interactions of these loops. And there is nothing in between the loops. Nothing, absolutely nothing. There's no geometry. There are no coordinates. There is no blackness. There's nothing. The only things that exist are the loops and what's on the surfaces of those loops. And those loops are what define the geometry, the three dimensions, and actually the four, too. So those are two different schools. Uh, the string theory school is very much like the old Newtonian idea that there's this background space against which things move. In their case, it's the strings. In loop quantum gravity, it's the Einstein approach, that there is no background, there is only the world lines of particles, and the world lines of those particles define <coughs> curvature and geometry and dimension and everything else you need. And that's why we have these two schools battling it out today. Now, there's good reason for the battle to be going on, because in loop quantum gravity, which is the preferred way of looking at things that's consistent with Einstein, they are really great <coughs> on the verge of calculating a lot of wonderful things in gravitation physics. The information content on the surface of a black hole, for instance, 
uh, other kinds of things that are just absolutely dramatic, incredible. Uh, they can do that. But their calculations don't include matter. They don't include electrons, they don't include photons, quarks, gluons, W particles, bosons, nothing. None of the standard model particles are in loop quantum gravity. It's purely a theory of space, time, and gravity. It's not a theory of matter as we know it. String theory is almost purely a theory of particles. It's rich in talking about particle states <coughs> represented as, as loops of string uh, moving in 10 or 11 dimensions. Uh, and it also promises to say something about gravity, but it does so from this background dependent point of view which even the string theorists say is going to be ultimately replaced at some point in the future once they figure out how to do the calculation. All physicists agree that background dependency is, is anti-relativistic, it's a holdover from Newton, and it's something that we desperately have to replace. But the string theorists don't quite know how to do that yet. The loop quantum gravity people do it right from the start, but they don't know how to build particles out of it. So we're sort of in that position right now, where we have the two schools going back and forth. Now, <clears throat> what do you want to make of this? What kind of a story do you want? Well, there are a couple of ways of, of exploring this. Um, one way is to think about analogies. Okay, let's let's feed the right hemisphere. Nothing wrong with doing that. I mean, where do you think string theory came from? Strings. Strings aren't some strange language that came from Mars. They're, they're basically the things on your shoes. They're, they're shoelaces and the properties of macaroni. Very visual things that, that uh, John Schwartz and, uh, and Michael Green back in 1982 came up with and applied to this particular kind of a subject. It was also present back in the early 60s uh, when people were discussing the quark model and how to bind quarks together. It was called the Hadronic String Theory. Uh, that was thrown out because it required, for logical consistency, a 26-dimensional space in order for uh, mathematical problems to be resolved properly. Uh, with String Theory today, it's uh, roughly a 10 or 11-dimensional theory. There are five string theories. Uh, each of them are 10-dimensional. But there is a larger thing called M-theory, uh, which incorporates all five of the consistent string theories by adding one more dimension uh, and so you know it's the highest level of perfection and that's, that's sort of how it works. The thing is that you have to buy into a different language. With M theory you now have things called brains. Uh, we live in a three-dimensional brain and basically all the particle states are confined to this brain. They can never sniff out uh, the fifth dimension, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh dimensions. Particle states can only see things within our three-dimensional brain. Gravity, or gravitons, are free to move uh, through all 11 dimensions uh, with impunity. Uh, and that's what makes gravity such a weak force, because gravity is spread out over 11 dimensions, whereas the particle states are only spread out over three. So that's kind of the argument for why gravity is such a super weak force. Uh, it's also the reason why there is no experiment that we can make on particles in our universe that would give any hint that there were more than three dimensions of space. Not zero. The only way that we can sniff out dimensions beyond the three is by studying how gravity operates, because it is free to move in those dimensions. So it's a kind of a censorship theory, which is very convenient. Uh, the standard model, which is the model that incorporates everything except gravity, is now the model that describes all particle interactions within our three-dimensional brain uh, with great accuracy and tells how photons can interact with things and why photons can never show us what an 11th dimensional universe looks like, even if that universe were only a millimeter away from us. And that's, that's, how it's, that's the extent of these hidden dimensions if they are spatial. Now, Steven Weinberg says, very correctly, 
that these extra dimensions that string theorists talk about are not spatial dimensions. They should not be confused in your minds as being additional dimensions of space. Uh, it's better to think of them in terms of bookkeeping tools. They are <clears throat> additional pieces of information that help describe particle states and why the particle states are what they are. And those additional dimensions can be thought of in pure mathematics as having a geometry to them. Because geometry, math in, in mathematics, geometry is pure. It's just pure numbers. The numbers don't mean meters. They don't mean anything. People can talk about spaces that are economic spaces. And those spaces don't mean dollars floating around in some strange dimension. They just mean additional ways of characterizing an, an economic system, additional parameters, and each of those parameters is a dimension. So that's how string theorists think about these extra dimensions. They are not spatial. Okay. They're, just, they're just basically bookkeeping that's necessary in order to keep the system logically consistent. Okay, so uh, in the background dependent idea, we have a, uh, a background geometry, which is this uh, grid work. And then, in this case, how many recognize what, what this, this might be? You see it every summer when you're swimming through the right? These are light caustics. I love light caustics. They're there and they're not, and they're produced by things that, that you know, lens focusing of water on the surface and the sunlight, and it's just, to me, it's magic, you know, just like rainbows, you know, hey, that's me. Uh, but, you know, think of the caustics as being these strings in string theory, and think of the coordinate grid as being this background. What string theory ultimately wants to do is to get rid of that coordinate grid and make all the coordinate information embedded somehow in those strings which have sort of the ephemeral nature of light caustics. They are confluences of, of energy in one dimension forming tubes that move through space time. Okay, so that's one way. We can think of uh, things moving against a pre-existing background. Another way of thinking about things is this way. What, what do you think this is? It's coral. Now, if you were to be an artist or thinking out of the box, uh, imagine that the coral represented matter and things in the universe, and the darkness represented nothing. This would be the relativistic picture. Einstein would say, the only thing that matters is what you see along those lines of coral. Those would be coral lines of particles in Einstein's description. And that blackness that you see behind, means nothing. <laughs> that the geometry that we keep talking about over and over again is the way that coral is bent. It's not a statement of what that empty nothingness is doing. That empty nothingness, if you're a mathematician, you're welcome to build a coordinate system to describe it. But that coordinate system and what it's representing has nothing to do with real particles. Um, think about it this way, too that in mathematics, we, one can create geometric ideas, lines, points, surfaces. Uh, there are two types of geometry that people work on. There's discrete geometry, which is kind of like a checkerboard. You know, there are discrete places in space where you can be, you can't be in between. Uh, or there's a continuous geometry, where you can put two slashes in space, and there are not just an infinite number of points between those two points, but there's a transfinite number of points. Uh, Cantor demonstrated that between zero and one, there weren't just an infinite number of possible numbers, there were a transfinite number. Not just infinity times infinity, or infinity to the infinite power, but an even larger ordinal that you couldn't even count to. And that's how many points there were between zero and one. Well. That's what manifests itself as, as a geometric manifold that mathematicians love to work with. But it's not clear that our physical world is that kind of thing at all. We have no proof that you can take a meter stick and subdivide it ad infinitum, beyond the scale of an atom, beyond the scale of what's below that, to an infinitely small separation. There is no objective proof that the universe is built that way. In fact, there is a mathematical proof 
that somewhere at a level of about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, called the Planck scale, uh, space poops out. Okay. That's the smallest distance, and there's a corresponding smallest time called the Planck time, 10 to the minus 46 seconds. And string theory uh, and loop quantum gravity are both things that ostensibly operate at that kind of a scale, that incredibly small scale. So you wouldn't even notice that these things are going on at the level of a quark or a gluon. They're going on orders of magnitude smaller resolution uh, beyond that. Conveniently smaller than you could ever measure. Well, you know, it's, that's, that's another, yeah, it, it has been said. Um, the way to think of, other ways of thinking about the nature of space is, uh, is by just investigating the heck out of pure mathematics. Uh, Roger Penrose uh, came up with the, what's called a twister formalism, uh, where basically, here's the analogy. Uh, you're inside a cave and there's a fire going on, and there's an ant crawling on the wall. You know, and you're, you're standing there, you're wearing a, you know, a cowboy hat and an arrow through your head and you know, whatever else, and you're standing by the fire, and your shadow is project projected on the cave wall, and the ant encounters that shadow and tries to make sense out of what it's seeing. You know, it has a real tough time figuring out what's going on. It, it can't really figure out what's going on because what's really going on is in three-dimensional space in a place that it can't reach. All it can see is the perigrations of this uh, shadow in its environment to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, twisters are like that. Twisters are not supposed to represent these are, this is a tool, okay? It's, it's a mathematical object that exists elsewhere whose relationships then help us build space and time. Okay. Uh, often these are referred to as spin networks. Uh, again, the dark area that you see behind you is nothing. There's nothing going on there. Those lines don't represent things moving from point A to point B. They just represent a magnitude of spin. Uh, think about this as, you know, here's two dollars, you know, here's two dollars, here's four dollars, here's three dollars in an economic space. You know, the basis for the space is, doesn't matter, but somehow you're interacting these dollars in some kind of a pattern in an abstract space. Uh, these spin networks are what the loop quantum gravity people use, and at each of these vertices, each of these spins contributes a fundamental element of area. And that fundamental element of area is what builds up space. And so if you take this entire pattern called spin foam, this spin foam actually represents how a particular volume of three-dimensional space is built up by the interaction of spins of particles called twisters. Again, this is a tool not, represent, not intended to represent sort of an x-ray of space at a small scale, but just a way for mathematicians to calculate something. In this case, fundamental areas building up fundamental volumes. Now, the reason that's interesting is because right now, you know, we've got this thing going on between uh, loop quantum gravity saying, hey, you know, we can build things, but we don't have to have a background space. And we have string theory saying, well, we need the background space, but we can build up all the particles. One possibility, which is now being looked at very carefully, is that they are not looking at the same things. The loop quantum gravity people might be looking at a scale smaller than a string. String theory is built up out of these loops. So that uh, once you put together uh, enough of these loops, you wind up with basically a string element. And so uh, the surface of the string is actually integrated a whole bunch of these little quantum loops of, of pure space, gravity. And maybe that's a way of resolving why we have these two ideas. That they're actually contributing to the same picture, but at a different magnification. That's one way out of the dilemma. Now, as for extra dimensions, uh, this is generally believed to be essentially nonsense. Um, these are not spatial dimensions, so you can't represent them like this and then try to say that somehow this is a representation of what space looks like. Uh, it, you know, it, 
it's, it's like basically putting a whole bunch of cash registers in a room and saying that the cash registers are part of the three dimensions to defining things in the room. It doesn't work that way. Uh, another tool is this, which has just come out. Uh, again, this isn't a representation of space. It's a, rep it's a tool that's used to build particle states and in particular the interactions of particles. But it's very pretty and it looks like something that you might find hanging you know, like a sun catcher in the Navajo community or somewhere in India, you know, on an ashram. You know, very pretty. But what I also like you to think about is that, you know, you don't have to wait for the next popular book to come out on the subject. You know, start enriching your own mind with patterns and ideas that, that show this character of background dependence and background independence, but yet where things are built up. Uh, here's a case. That, that I found. Here's another case which is really pretty. It's uh, basically soap foam and oil on a driveway. <laughs> but it looks like one has basically taken discrete space and integrated it together into a very smooth thing at the top. And then of course my favorite is the spider web filled with dew. Um, I find this in my mind a very potent way of thinking about space and gravity and everything else. Uh, because it has all the ingredients to it that I want. First of all, it doesn't require a background. Uh, the do exists only on the web. It doesn't exist in between the web segments, which is basically what Einstein says. Uh, the geometry of the web can be curved or bent or whatever, depending on local circumstances. So it has properties of geometry in it. And I think it's, it's very visually interesting. And in fact, this is the kind of idea that forms the basis of string theory and loop quantum gravity. The idea that, that space is kind of this network and that things only exist on the network. Um, there, the voids in between mean nothing, which is what Einstein said. And before you worry about leaving this room and falling into one of these voids, you don't really have to worry. Even if you were an astronaut in space, you still wouldn't fall into one of these voids. And the reason is, that even in outer space, we have so many particles per cubic centimeter and so many photons of light flowing through those volumes <coughs> that essentially the, the volume of space that isn't intersected by a world line of some material particle or even virtual particle is immeasurably small, probably smaller than the size of an atom. But still, it's important to have that as part of your physical reality <coughs> space. And, and that's why string theory and <coughs> quantum gravity are, are spending so much time obsessing on this subject. Because they have to build the universe from the ground up. They have to show how the voids start out being large relative to each other, and then add it up, they basically vanish into a continuum, which is what we experience in the world of the large. Okay, now for my plug. I'm not a very good used car salesman. Um, when I wrote Patterns in the Void back in 2003, um, a lot of people liked it. It sold pretty really well. Uh, basic Books uh, thought it was a, a pretty strong show for uh, you know a popularization. Um, it didn't sell as well as it could, mainly because I think it, it was kind of portrayed as a downer book. I was writing on the nature of darkness, and so I put in uh, ritual human sacrifice in there. <laughs> 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 you know, and you can only go so far with that theme, I'm sorry. Uh, and you start losing people. Uh, but the thing is that my notes for that book, I, I wrote those notes like a decade earlier because I've always been interested in this subject about the nature of space. Um, and, and so, thanks to ebooks, how many of you have Kindles? Okay, go buy my book. Uh, I basically took the book, which uh, you can either get the 300 page version with 150 illustrations uh, for $8, uh, or you can get the 160 page version with 80 illustrations for, I think, uh, $5. So, for the price of a box of Fruit Loops or organic cereal, you can learn just about everything you want to learn about where modern quantum space theory is right now. Where, where are you ever going to get the secret of the universe given to you in a box of cereal? I mean, come on. So, you know, I, I encourage you to buy my book and buy it as often as you can. Um, you know, do what you got to do. 
I, I say this sort of in jest, but in, in seriousness, um, you have to understand that when you write articles for astronomy, you get $1,500 per article, and maybe you get one article per year published. You're not going to get rich on that. You're not going to do anything really with that level of money other than the satisfaction of having helped a lot of people. Uh, Ebooks, um, it's about the same. I mean, it's a limited audience, it's a small exposure. You know, I'm not going to retire earlier because I'm selling this book. But the thing is, if you want to keep people like me still in the game of doing popularizations and trying to communicate this stuff in a sensible way, at some point you've got to cough up the box of cereal. Otherwise, we're going to disappear. Uh, this, this is my first and last effort in ebooks uh, in this subject area. If it does well, I'll consider writing additional books, maybe not necessarily on quantum gravity, but maybe some other thing like the search for uh, births and things like that. But, you know, it really is public supported. Um, and, and that's how it sort of has always worked anyway. So anyway, uh, enjoy the, the topic. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to sort of yeah. answer what I can. Is it only available on ebooks? It's only available on ebooks. That's right. Um, I'm not even going to a publisher because the thing is that there are two levels of science popularizers in this country. There are those of us that sell maybe 5,000 books, and then there are the Stephen Hawkins. There is no middle ground for what we do. None. And so, you know, I'm not a Stephen Hawking. Any mistake that I make, I, it's not because of software. <laughs> it's, uh, it's because of the way I put things together, which is closer, I think, to the way you put things together. Anyway. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.